again, everyone. Welcome to Tessal Ontario Dialogue Session. And tonight's topic is Drama Informed Spaces in Education. Our presenter is Nicole Johnson. I'm your host, Gunor. And our moderator today is Melita. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so I'm going to give you some information about Nicole. Nicole has been a professor at Sheraton College in the social service worker program for 15 years. Nicole has worked in the social mm -hmm. service sector for 20 years in anti-violence against women and children. She holds a master's in education from University of Toronto. Nicole's research work led to her recently launched Cultivating Trauma-Informed Spaces in Education, Promising Practices manual to support educators and professionals with practical pedagogical strategies in addressing trauma in learning and workplaces. She is a passionate educator that believes in cultivating safer and braver spaces to support learners and educators impacted by trauma. So I'm just going to give you a little bit information about the Tussle Dialogue session. Tussle Dialogue session is quite different than the webinar session that we have. It's going to last hour and a half long. So we have total basically for two introductory questions and five discussion question, and we have one breakout room activity question. So basically how the dialogue session is work is, feel free to turn on your camera if you feel comfortable. If you don't, you can leave it as it is, but we'll love to see you if you like to, you know, um, turn that on, we'll love that. And if you feel like uh, participating, and please raise your hand, and so that we can give you a chance to participate with your video and camera on. And if you like, you can also participate uh, under uh, chat. And Melita will be moderating our chat this evening and she'll be reading that out loud to everyone. So feel free to participate that way. As I introduce first question, subject expert matter, Nicole will get a first chance to explain the question and give detail about it and later on the floor will open to everyone so in that case feel free to participate and we'll do the same thing with the discussion question finally breakout room activity question is one of my favorite and i believe many of our favorite one because you get a chance to meet with other colleagues maybe friends and make some good connection and basically talk about that specific question that Nicole prepared for you and um, make sure to choose somebody that who will be a speaker on behalf of everyone in that group and make sure to remember the breakout num room number because we'll be calling out that group one who would like to participate and then you might say I don't know which group I was in so that way you know exactly which group you were in and you can easily participate let's move on so we'll start with the first introductory question we have. What is trauma? So I'm going to start as I explained earlier with Nicole, which is our subject expert matter. And then after that, the floor will open to everyone. Nicole, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Kanal and Melita. Um, hello, everyone. It's great to be here uh, today. And I look forward to a really great conversation and learning alongside you as well. So uh, just to get us started, yeah, just as a as a baseline part of the conversation is just to get understanding of what trauma is. Um, there's a, many def different definitions out there. And that's something that we found in our research was um, there's some really great definitions. There's some very narrow um, definitions or some definitions with some gaps. Um, but what we did find in developing our own definition is that number one, we want to recognize that trauma is in the eye of the beholder. So it's however one person defines trauma is trauma for them. And so we want to always recognize that it's how we perceive and experience things. But what we do know as well from research is that trauma is a subjective response to something that could be expected. It could be unexpected. It could be an event, a collection of events, repeated experiences, or the accumulation of multiple experiences that make someone feel unsafe and maybe a loss of control as well. 
Um, trauma takes many different forms. It could be a single incident. It could be developmental. It happens from infant, childhood, um, or as a teenager, or all of the above. It can be complex and repetitive as well. Um, it can be historical, and it can be intergenerational, um, which we know um, many marginalized communities have faced collective traumas that are historical and are passed on from generation to generation. Um, we know many people experience trauma in other ways as well. Um, trauma is very much rooted in oppression, uh, patriarchy, colonization. And so any type of oppression, racism, sexism, homophobia, and the other many important isms, um, they are traumatic experiences that, that people are living with and navigating every day. And as well, trauma can be experienced as people navigate systems in life. So whether they're navigating the educational system, which is the spaces that we're all operating in, um, social services, medical system, and many other types of systems. And us helping professionals, educators also can experience trauma through vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue. Um, as we're all bringing our best and our empathetic, compassionate selves to our work, um, we can definitely be impacted as well. Okay, now the floor is open. All the audiences we have this evening, please feel free to raise your hand um, so that you can participate or you can use the chat function and we'll start from there. Thank you, Nicole. That was a great definition. Um, I like that Jane said it's an emotional response to an event, like it could be an accident, accident. or natu natural disaster. And it's that that response, right? That can be emotional, physical, spiritual. It can be it can affect us in many different ways. Okay, let's move on to the question two then. Um, so, what is the trauma informed education from your perspective? Again, I'll start with Nicole, and then the floor will open to everyone. Over to you, Nicole. Thanks. So trauma-informed practice might be a term that people might be familiar with, and that, that was a term developed by Harris and Fallot in 2001. And that concept was, is, and that theory is very much used in the helping professions. Um, many social services, social work communities, I think the medical profession is working from that lens. I think even police officers are doing that work now. Um, but that the basic theory behind that is that there's a core values of trust, safety, choice, collaboration, and empowerment. So those, those philosophies are very much integrated into what we call trauma-informed education. Um, one of our parts of our work is, has been developing a broader definition um, because there's, again, like trauma, there's so many different definitions and understandings of what trauma-informed practices and what trauma-informed education is. Um, so we call our term trauma-informed education grounded in a systemic analysis. And the reason we do that is we want to push beyond those principles and to help people see that as educators in any role that, that anyone works from, if we come from a perspective of recognizing that anyone has, and most people have likely experienced some type of trauma, that's sort of the framework. If you go in with that belief that all of us here in this space, in our classrooms, our colleagues, our family members have likely experienced trauma. Um, and when we know that when over 80% of people have identified as having experienced trauma in Canada, we, we know that statistic. Then if you go in with that lens, you're going to bring a certain approach and framework and strategies to better support people so that they can learn more safely. And so it is a multifaceted pedagogical approach um, it's very much rooted in some other really important theories that I'm sure you're all familiar with, like equity, diversity, inclusion is very much related and relevant. Um, anti-racism and anti-oppression is very much connected to this philosophy, harm reduction and universal design of learning. Um, and basically it recognizes that trauma is a systemic problem, that it is rooted in, and as I said earlier, it's rooted in patriarchy and colonization oppression, all of these experiences, and that anyone can experience trauma across their lifespan. Um, and so further from that is it brings in an analysis and understanding, but it also comes with some strat practical strategies of how we can actually better support people who have experienced trauma. Um, and that includes our colleagues, that includes the learners in our spaces. 
Um, and that's one thing that I think we'll share later is the manual that we developed, which has many different strategies. And we'll talk about those tonight, some practical strategies that I'm sure you're already doing, or you might think about adding to your toolkit to better support people. So just again, just to kind of sum up, it's an assumption that if you go in believing that anyone you're interacting with is likely a trauma survivor, then you're going to come in with greater empathy and compassion and some good approaches to better support them so that they can learn and work more safely. I have a long definition in our manual. It's, it's kind of hard to recap it all into to, to a few words, but um, I hope that was helpful. Yes. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was very, very helpful. And you did give, um, you know, very detailed explanation to this specific question. Also, uh, I just want to take our attendant, you know, um, audience's attention, Milita, you know, uh, share the link. Uh, Nicole shared it with us. Please make sure to download that to your favorites or put it on your desktop. That will be the case that you can look into it later on. So now is floor open to our audiences. Uh, so by the way, just just so we understand, this is a safe space as well. And please, whatever shared uh, is shared with us here that, um, you know, I've been backpedaling ever since Nicole started speaking. I'm backpedaling and thinking about the classroom. And um, I, I've had some interesting individuals. What do you say to a person? Have you had trauma? Um, can I help you? Like, I, I don't want to be that person. I want to be equal footing in the classroom, mm -hmm. right? And how, how do I approach that? That's a very Harmony. Point. Harmony has a question, please. Go ahead, yes. Harmony. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, so actually, it's not really in response to the question that you were asking, but just looking at the, uh, the topic that we were just, uh, everyone was just um, discussing. Um, I think one of the things that really jumped out at me from the definition you just gave is that the vast majority of people will identify as having experienced some sort of trauma. And that's something that never actually crossed my mind before, right. um, where I think it might actually link to the question that, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, um, but that you were asking about how do you respond to someone when they state that maybe they have experienced trauma is that if so many people have done so, there's a certain normal, like, like I think maybe a safe space is a space where that is I need to think carefully about how to word this. Mm -hmm. Not so much that trauma is normalized, but the experience of trauma is normalized. So in that sense where you acknowledge and recognize that, you know, this is something that we might all share rather than looking at the person who reports um, experiencing trauma with some sort of pity. Right. Um, and how, sure do you, you get my how do you cross that there. line though as well, Harmony, right? Yeah, and I, I kind of feel like it's one of those things where I don't know if there's any sort of set rule for it because it is so subjective. My guess would be that it's, as you were saying, it's in the eye of the beholder. You need to take this on the terms of the person who has experienced trauma. For sure. I love what you said, Harmony. And I think you know one of our working assumptions that we we kind of work from is assume that everyone's experienced trauma unless proven otherwise we don't need to know we don't need to ask the question um that in fact that would probably be inappropriate to ask our students that question right and not everyone like all of us here might identify use the word trauma we might say we've been through stress we've been through different difficult things but not everyone uses the word trauma so we definitely wouldn't want to ask that question to somebody and it that could actually um, activate or trigger them in a way too, right? Um, but I like that you said around it, I think you wanted to even use the word normalize, right? Um, so trauma is so common, we do want to normalize that in the, in the classroom and in our spaces to recognize that most people, most of us have those lived experiences. Um, and I love an expression that I'd heard once is that trauma experiences, the, the trauma that happens to people that's abnormal, like that should not be happening, right? So traumatic experiences are abnormal, but how we respond to trauma, that's normal. So if we start to reframe and see that in a different way, that the behaviors, and that's one of the questions we'll ask you later, is the behaviors that we're seeing in our learning spaces, 
those are normal responses to abnormal events. And um, that view really shifts from pathologizing and stigmatizing people, which is what we want to start doing more of. Absolutely. Thank you, Harmony. Um, that's really good points that you make and Nicole as well. Anybody else would like to participate? Not right now. Maybe we'll get some people soon. Yeah. We've okay. got Harmony. Good for you, Harmony. Yes, thank you. Thank we you. Appreciate that. And anybody, you can also put it in the chat as well. Well, we've got um, we've got a few. Okay. Uh, let me just back backspace it here for a bit. Mm -hmm. So sure. it uh, this is from Jane. Uh, so suppose so are you supposed to set up a safe space or a brave space in our classrooms? Good I love point. that. I love that, Jane. Yeah, yeah, I think I like to use the word safer because I can't guarantee that all 45 students in my class are gonna be safe. I can't guarantee that. We all define and experience safety differently based on our identities and our lived experience. So I usually say things like how together, collectively, how can we come up with some guidelines or an agreement that we can have a safer space for all of us to learn and grow together um, and a braver space because it does take bravery to learn and challenge and in some subjects, you know, the conversations are really hard. And so having braver spaces. So it's not, it's never an absolute. Um, so I, I like the language of safer and braver. Excellent. Never looked at it that way. Thank you. Another question uh, from Hand. Does it need all teachers? Oh, do we need all teachers to be trained to recognize signs of trauma in students and deal with trauma? And I think it's a really great practice for our organizations to offer that training to us. That's that's something we're definitely advocating for is that all employees and not just educators, I think, you know, I work at Sheridan College. I'd love to see every single employee be trained because we all interact with students. We all interact with colleagues um, who have lived experiences. Um, so yes, training is a really great thing. We don't have to be experts on trauma to be a trauma-informed educator. I think that is one of the misconceptions um, you can learn some of the very basics about trauma and, tra and have some awareness of responses and how trauma affects learners, because mm -hmm. it absolutely does. And that will just add to your toolkit of being a really great educator, but you don't have to be an expert um, in trauma to do this work. Thank you. And another one from Harmony, I guess she's lost her voice. Uh, and she puts in quotes, and brave emphasizes courage and resilience over victimization and feelings of powerlessness, which is often where well-intentioned compassion, that's good, ends up going. Mm -hmm. That's a nice yeah, point as well. I love that. We want to think of, um, I love the term post-traumatic growth, right? So we go through hard things in life um, and we all work through them over our lifespan, but through those difficult experiences, we also grow and transform and develop amazing skills and resources and techniques and empathy and compassion and so um, we want to see that in our learners and colleagues that they may have gone through hard things but there's also incredible resilience and growth and strength that that's there as well nancy's got um a six seven class she was supplying for and they were talking about some of canada's most notorious criminals and killers hamalka and her husband came up and during the discussion of of their horrible crimes, one of my female students burst in tears uh, and was inconsolable beyond giving a hug and rubbing her shoulders and letting her cry. I didn't know what to do. Wow. Oh, that is That's cool. powerful too. It's yeah. really powerful. Um, Nancy, yeah, I think, um, I think a really good trauma-informed education practice, and I'm not sure if you had the chance to do that, but as you're leading into showing a video or a conversation on hard topics, um, I teach social work courses, so every week is or always hard topics, so we kind of do this a lot, um, but I'm sure all of you are having hard conversations as well on hard topics. Um, but a good thing to do is just to lead in to say, next week in class, we're gonna be talking about um, notorious criminals and killers in Canada. We're going to specifically be talking about the Homolka case, which many of you may be familiar with. And if you're not, um, it is um, a very difficult story to understand um, and may bring up a lot of feelings for you mm -hmm. and thoughts and memories for those of you that were here when that story came out. 
And you can even use a little self-disclosure. I know I remember I was a teenager when that happened. So I remember it very seriously. Um, and I just want to prepare the class for this conversation that's going to happen next week. So you're kind of giving people some notice. Heads and up. the more the more people prepare, they come in, right? They can make that choice. First of all, do I come or do I not? If I'm coming, I know what's going to happen. I know my, my teacher, Nancy, is going to be very supportive. So I'm going to be okay. And so the more that there's preparation and showing of support, that can really help people get through that. Can someone still cry, like in the case of yours? Um, absolutely, because they're empathetic and, and feel things and we don't know what their lived experience is. Um, but I think also creating space to debrief after the video um, or the discussion, being mindful of if you're showing videos, I'm really conscious of videos that are too graphic. Um, I've actually cut out a lot of videos in my classes just because some of them kind of like Hollywood movies, like they're just over the top and re-traumatizing often to watch. Right. And so I'm really, I screen a lot of the things and, and, and decide whether or not to show them. Um, and then just right. making time to debrief and support and be compassionate like you were. Those are some good strategies. Yeah. Uh, and she she quotes good point. By the way, this is not a webinar. Uh, as much as I love reading the chat, please turn on your mics. You don't have to show your beautiful faces, but at least we can hear your voices. All right. Phew. Wonderful. Okay, everybody. That's a that was a great participation. See, Nicole, we are warming up. Oh, great. <laughs> We're getting great. there slowly. Yes. <laughs> okay. Let's start with the discussion question now. Yeah. So the first question, how does trauma impact learning and how does it show up in the learning environment? Again, I'll start with Nicole and For then sure. we'll be open to the audiences. So absolutely, there is lots of research over decades now that shows trauma impacts learning um, and our ability to be safe to learn. So we know that. Um, does trauma show up in our classrooms? Absolutely. And in ways that we can expect and not always expect, um, I think as educators, we should go in really looking at behaviors and, and wondering what those are. Like, are those actually trauma responses or is it personality or something else going on? Um, but I know often we see behaviors like um, we might we might even think or say out loud or to our colleagues, you know, that student is really disengaged. They're not they're kind of lazy. They're. Um, difficult, they're out of control, they're not contributing, they never come to class, they don't care. Any of those kind of thoughts that sometimes pop up in our head or we say them, um, we really have to kind of challenge that because what could really be happening and is most likely happening is people are having trauma responses in our spaces and it's showing up in these ways. And so if we kind of get rid of that thought and just think instead, hmm, I wonder if they're not participating because they don't feel safe. I wonder if they're getting an argument with the group members, it's because they're being triggered by something that they're doing. Um, I wonder if they stopped coming to class because they knew what our topic was this week. So really kind of changing how we see things is really helpful. Um, and just really quickly, just some ways that trauma impacts our learning. Um, trauma increases the chances of depression and substance use. Um, trauma increases people's chance of not believing in themselves and doubting themselves. Um, people have gone through trauma are more likely to be triggered or activated by content that, that we might be showing. Um, they might be something called hyper aroused. So they're hyper vigilant, they're on alert. So any loud noises or, or situations or content could easily make them feel very unsafe. And then hypo aroused is another term where people are, come across as sort of emotionless or numb. And that's just their way of taking care of themselves too. But that might come across like they don't care, but it's actually, they're actually feeling very unsafe and their nervous system is responding in that way. Um, also people who experience trauma could be impacted by their lack of confidence. So they might not feel like they could take risks in the classroom. They may not raise their hand. They might not have a trouble finding a group. Um, they might miss classes, avoid things, or not submit assignments. And then again, some of the behaviors we see could be coping strategies and survival strategies that are helping them get through 
those difficult moments in class. So at the end of the day, um, if someone is bringing traumatic experiences and feeling unsafe, they're not gonna learn. So everything we're trying to teach, they're not gonna learn. They're not gonna be able to concentrate. They're not gonna take it in if they're feeling unsafe. Perfect. Thank you, Nicole. We appreciate that. Now, please feel free to raise your hand um, or unmute your mic or oh great harmony thank you you're rock today harmony <laughs> well actually in this case it's a question rather than a response um and i was wondering if um nicole if you could elaborate a little bit further on maybe some of the differences between say a response where someone is actually being triggered in that moment Mm. Um, versus maybe a more long-term sort of coping mechanism. So for instance, um, if I recall correctly, sort of someone who is really, really eager to sort of please the, someone who's people-pleasing, for instance, mm -hmm. that might be a sort of long-term trauma response. Mm -hmm. But that's not something you would immediately notice and register, oh, this person just got triggered by something. Mm -hmm. um, are there ways to sort of maybe look out for those as well? Yeah, what a great question. Um, we could do a whole three hours on that. <laughs> and that's all. Being... So triggers, or um, sometimes we call being activated. The word trigger, by the way, we're trying to move away from that language. I still say it a lot. I think I've said it multiple times today. Um, but that word itself can trigger people too. So mm -hmm. even when we say trigger warning, this is a video we're watching today, that actually gets people in a their, their nervous system responds to that and they get um, nervous, right? But what are we going to do? What's happening? Um, so I think some words that we like to use, I try to, I'm trying to get better at using are when, you know, we might feel uncomfortable, unsafe, um, activated, things like that. So coming back to your question, um, people can show that they're activated or responding in class by like, I think the example earlier, someone's crying someone runs out of the classroom, they don't come back. Um, someone looks like they're spacing out, like they're dissociating. Someone maybe just puts their head down and starts doodling. Someone maybe is trying to talk to someone beside them. There's so many ways that we can show that we're being activated by what's happening. Um, there's something called the seven Fs. So I think you've all heard of fight, flight, freeze responses. There's other ones like fawn and flock and flop and flood. Um, so those are some ways, and we touch on, just touch on that in the manual if you wanna check it out. Um, but I love your other point around, what about those people pleasing behaviors too that we often see and we're like, oh, that's such a great student, but maybe there is more to that. Maybe there is that people pleasing that they see you as an authority figure, which they often do because there's that power difference. Um, and maybe there's some fear, right? So maybe that could be a trauma response as well. So I think at the end of the day, we don't always know, but what we want to challenge ourselves is to move away from any kind of judgment of behaviors we see and come from that place of empathy and understanding and say, hmm, I wonder if the reason they're acting that way right now is a trauma response because they're being affected by something I'm doing or something that's happening in the class. And again, we don't have to know it all. We don't have to ask them questions. We just come from empathy and compassion and, and try to change things and, and cater things to make sure that we're ensuring everyone feels as safe as possible. Uh, cool. uh, thanks, Nicole. This is from Harmony again. I, I actually didn't realize a trigger and trigger warnings were being phased out. It's good it's to a, know. It's a controversial one because I think mm -hmm. people also say, well, but everyone knows what that word means, right? And I think even in your all of your profession, like you're trying to explain words and language. And um, so we still need to use these words sometimes to help people understand what we mean. But I usually just kind of, I'll always explain that and then just replace with, and I'll just suggest some alternative words to use when we can as well. Very nice. Thank you. Perfect, thank you everyone for participating. <clears throat> Anybody else would like to add anything? before we move on to the next question. Ready? So question two, what are some 
high inform promising practices you are using in your work. Again, over to you, Nicole. Let's start with sure. So if you'd like a light reading of 80 pages or more, um, check out the manual. <laughs> it's a very big book, um, but there's pieces you can pull and add to your toolkit as an educator. Um, but to some essential ones, and I heard someone say it earlier, um, building safer learning spaces. You know, number one is a really good trauma-informed practice. So, and do that with your learners, with your students. Um, create agreements together. Like, what do they need from you? What do you need from each other? Um, and that automatically, like, people are voicing what they need to feel safer in that space. So I think collaboratively doing that, like the first time you meet and then keep reminding people that these are our guidelines um, is a great strategy. Um, model inclusive practices like your pronouns, people first language, use non-violent language. There's so much violence in our vocabulary. Um, and I've created a handout that, I don't know if that could be shared at some point on alternatives to language like there's so many words that we all use I'm, i was shocked when i did this like how many words i use every single day that have violent connotations and you don't mean to but they do um, even the word like de assignment deadlines deadlines um why can't we call it a due date instead something like that so watching our language um, and as someone said earlier, normalizing trauma in our spaces is a really good strategy just to let people know, like we all bring lived experience here. We all might be impacted some weeks by the content, um, how you respond is normal for you. Like just a simple message like that really goes a long way to help people feel safer. Um, your curriculum is really important. There's a lot we can do here, making sure going through like sort of audit your curriculum like the activities you show, the videos, your assignments, your PowerPoints, your handouts, is there anything in there that could possibly impact your learners in a negative way, vicarious trauma or re-traumatization? Um, you can kind of screen that. Um, your case study stories, your videos, there's so much we can look at there. Um, I also like to provide sensitive content notifications in advance. You know, this video I'm gonna show has the following themes, you might have some reactions to it, things like that. So giving some, some notice about that. Um, always keeping your learners or your students' well-being at the top of mind. Check in with them. If someone leaves class early because and they look like they're upset, send them an email and check in with them the next day. Um, show you care, show the compassion. Um, and then I think another big piece is just doing a lot of our own work, like reflective practice, making sure that we're mindful of um, how we come across, like how we hold space, how people are affected by us um, based on our identity and how we come across. Um, people experience us in different ways. And so the more we reflect, the more we ask our students for feedback on what's working, what we can do differently, and the more educating and learning we can keep doing can make us um, a better educate, trauma-informed educator as well. Thank you, Nicole. Now we are waiting our audience to participate. So what are some trauma-informed promising practices you are using in your work or in your classroom or at school with your coworkers? Nicole, I have a question. I was just um, thinking again. Um, what about for the lower levels of people in English who are not that high functioning or can't express what they're feeling? Do you have any suggestions on how to handle them or how to understand them better? Yeah. Um, I think, yeah and also, is everyone going to want to talk in a exactly. large class or to you privately? Mm -hmm. um, one thing I try to do too is give people like, a card where they can express themselves to me and they can say their name, their pronouns, um, anything that they want me to know about them, what they might be feeling, their concerns. Um, and they can do that privately and just give that, that card to me. So that that's some, cause they don't always want to come talk to us or if there's right. barriers to doing that. Um, that might be a way. Um, if you have a chance to talk, to pull someone aside or if they come in class early or later and you can just check in with them. Right. Um, yeah, just 
giving different opportunities for people to express themselves in different ways. Um, maybe you can do an art activity in class and people can express how they're feeling through art. I love art. doing, I'm not an artist, and I, I wish yes. I was an artist. I want, want to be artist, but I bring art to my classrooms all the time. Um, sometimes I'll just tell people like, draw a picture of how you're feeling today or I love that in one word. Mm -hmm. um, or after a heavy class on a sticky note, write down one word you're feeling. And if you want to share it with the class or if you want to rip it up and stomp on it, do that. I love um, that. Yeah. It's a little, That's great. little different things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a great little exercise too. Absolutely. And it's a learning process for everyone as well at the mm -hmm. same time. Yes. Right? Yeah. Especially if they're very low level student, just mm -hmm. making doing some sort of emoji, like a happy face. Emoji. Right. Yeah, right. That's good. That tells a lot, actually, to the instructor, right? So that will yes. be really helpful. Because some of them, they can't even make a sentence, how they are going to express anything, right? Mm -hmm. But the art will bring some life to their feelings mm -hmm. and some interpretation, I guess. Yeah. Has anyone else used any strategies or something that um, that has helped with the ESL or in your lower levels of teaching and you and it was an aha moment oh my gosh i need to share this because it worked anybody yes so uh could you ring everybody hi my uh, son hi so thank you so much for this lecture webinar whatever so thank uh to be honest um maybe one of my strategies of teaching literacy level mm -hmm. um is um uh, at the beginning of uh, each semester, I usually give them um, uh, faces like sad, uh, nervous, anxious, happy, excited. So every time when I come to class, I ask them, how do you feel today? Show me your face. Are you OK? Are you happy uh, when you go home? How do you feel? <laughs> so in this case, I think that I have indication uh, from their reaction like how do they feel so i i i've never had a, um um an experience of um trauma students in my classroom so maybe i never experienced this before but until now um it's going very well with me like i have no uh, no issues so uh, i think this is this one this is uh, one of my uh, strategies um to to understand my students feelings i love it thank you that's Thank perfect. you so much. Very mm -hmm. good. Especially for level level, I think oh. it's excellent. Even providing the handout and they just do it, whatever they feel that, that's really good. Thank you for sharing that. Wonderful. Anybody else? You can put it in the chat as well or just turn on your mic. Turn on your mic. <laughs> You've got time. Share with us. Looks like Nicole is starting to get her tickle back in her throat. So <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. Excellent. I would just like to say one thing as a mostly supply teacher for the last 13 years. So my experience is short term with many, many different classes. And um, many of the students I have taught over the years uh, sporadically as their supply teacher. You get to know some of them after a while and they start to uh, uh, open up to you after a while. And what I've seen is if they want to talk, they'll come to me. Mm -hmm. And I had several, for example, um, there was an older uh, Muslim lady, I forget what she was, I think it was, she was from Afghanistan and she was so intimidated and so overwhelmed. Um, why don't I turn on my camera? She was Yay! so <laughs> Voila! Thank Technology! You. I know. <laughs> um, she you. was very, very overwhelmed uh, with everything with life in Canada. And she was in her 60s, I believe. Very shy. Very hard to get her to speak above a whisper. After I'd known her for a couple of years, she had much more confidence. She still was struggling with English, but she felt a lot better. She would just come to me sometimes just to say hi, just to smile. And one day her son came up to me during class and he said, my mother just wants you to know that back home in Afghanistan, she's a doctor. And I thought, you know, I keep forgetting these things, that these students who are coming here from all these other countries, they're not just lumps of clay waiting to have English thrown at them. They all have, they have careers, they have histories, they have stories that they come here with and all kinds of trauma that they're dealing with that we have no idea 
Um, I'm thinking in particular of one man from Syria. His family came from Syria. He was in my level one evening class. And 98% of the time, he wasn't in class. And when he did come in class, he was always reeking of cigarette smoke. And I was very, what do I do with him? He eventually left the class altogether. And I found out that he was dealing with the fact that his little boy, who had come with them from Syria, had some shrapnel in his head from an attack in Syria um, just before they came to Canada. And his little boy was in Toronto Sick Kids Hospital for weeks and weeks dealing with this shrapnel in his brain. So every once in a while, we have to realize, wow, these people have gone through hell and back to be here. And maybe they want to learn English, but really that's really not their big stress right now. Their big stress is trying to live through what they've lived through. Mm -hmm. And just you don't even need to say anything to them. Just be there for them and listen if they want to talk. And if they, you know, sometimes they talk about how sick their children are. They're, they're lonely. They're miserable. They're homesick. Mm -hmm. um, and just be there. Just listen. That's the best thing that I found that I can do is just listen. Don't talk. Just say Okay, how are you? What's Wonderful. going on? Thank you. Thank Nancy. you. Thank you. Oh, so emotional. That's so powerful, yeah. Nancy. Thank you for sharing that. I think when you say that, Nancy, I think like everyone has, like you said this, like everyone has a story, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't leave our lives and trauma at the door when we come into our classrooms. Like we bring our full selves. We do too, right? As teachers and educators. Um, and so coming from that place of like empathy and listening and that's all you can do and there's not there's no words sometimes especially when you hear stories like the one you gave harmony is up next with her hand in the air hi harmony so um the story that we just heard it actually reminded me of something that happened when i was doing my training so the practicum during my uh tesla training um when i was based in george brown and this was literally right at the start of the pandemic it was like before it was actually a pandemic but people knew there was COVID-19 but it seemed like something out there in the rest of the world rather than here in Canada um and I just remember um you know I don't want to turn my camera on but for the record I'm Chinese Canadian so this was something that was already on my mind a lot and there was this sort of I remember feeling really anxious myself because there was this like fear of like anti-Asian sentiment because at the time the virus was predominantly still in China. Um, but then as the weeks went by and it actually started to spread for out elsewhere, I remember at one point, um, one of the students in the class um, who was from Iran and she just got really, really worked up, like literally like begging, pleading with everyone in the classroom to to sanitize, to wash their hands, to be careful. And this was around when there was that massive outbreak in Iran. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't really trauma in the sense of a past experience, but something happening right now in the moment that was triggering a similar sort of arousal. Um, so I think at the time, the, the t I, I was just there as a practicum student, so it wasn't really my place to intervene. But I think the teacher just let her talk it out Mm -hmm. just let her share what she wanted to say um and also made a habit then of actually having a bottle of hand sanitizer on his desk so if any student actually did feel like they would be more comfortable using it going in and out of classroom they could do so thank you so yeah that was my that's something i've witnessed mm -hmm. thank you harmony yeah brought a lot of anxiety right around those sure. experiences so sure. even asking the class like what do you need to feel safer in here right around this experience is, is good okay Ganol, what's that third question i'm anxious all right mm -hmm. let's <laughs> what challenges that's right what challenges mm -hmm. have you faced in implementing trauma-informed education strategies that's a very good one yeah so i think there's different types of challenges. Sometimes the challenges are ours of just trying to find what works and what doesn't and learn from mistakes. But I think what the challenges that we're kind of seeing is more organizationally is in people's knowledge. So um, do you have support behind you 
to implement these strategies in your work, in your spaces, right? Does the organization like work from this lens, right? If they don't, then it might be hard to do some of these things. So I think from an organizational point of view, um, not every organization sort of names themselves as trauma-informed um, because for trauma-informed practice and education to really work, it needs to be infused at all levels of an organization, top down, bottom up. And I don't think we're there yet with a lot of places, right? We definitely found that in our research. Um, knowledge of trauma and trauma-informed education, there's so many different understandings around it that we're not all on the same page. So if we don't all understand the same way, there's risks we're gonna make mistakes as well. So that's a real challenge. Um, also confidence and fear. We've heard from a lot of people that they're afraid to make mistakes. They're, they'll say, well, I'm not a counselor. I'm not an expert on trauma. How can I do this work? Um, and as I said earlier, you don't have to be an expert. You just need to have some basic knowledge of what trauma is and the responses and how it affects learners and learn some strategies, many of which we're all probably already doing and we never really called them trauma-informed strategies. Mm -hmm. But getting over some of those fears and sort of building our confidence can go a long way. Um, and doing this work requires some vulnerability and yes. some of us are afraid to be vulnerable for very valid reasons, right? Our histories might not have supported us being vulnerable. So being a trauma-informed educator requires some vulnerability and working with others who are vulnerable. So we have to be in a place to be okay with that. And then um, I'd say that another point is resistance and buy-in. Um, and pretty much every presentation and workshop I've done in the last year, there's always a few questions from people around, this isn't relevant to me. Like, why am I needing to talk about trauma? Why do I need to do this? Um, shouldn't people just learn to manage things themselves um, and deal with things? And are we coddling our students if we bring these strategies? So that's usually a question I often get. Um, and I would really sort of challenge that, that <clears throat> bringing these strategies supports everybody. There's no harm. There's more risk of harm if we don't employ these strategies. And so if we take an approach of thinking trauma is not relevant in my class, then we are risking, we're actually at risk of causing harm to our students. If, we, if we're sort of trauma, we might be trauma inducing where we are actually bringing things into our classrooms that are actually causing trauma. So that's a problem too. So there's trauma indifferent, trauma inducing and trauma informed. And we really wanna to work towards being more in the trauma informed. Um, so I always say to people when there's some resistance is, um, do we wanna help people learn the best they can? And I'd hope all educators would say yes. Um, then let's remove some of those barriers and trauma is a barrier. So let's try to work um, through some of those barriers. But yeah, those are some of the challenges that we've seen and heard. Thank you, Nicole. <clears throat> so now is floor open to our audiences. Please feel free to participate. Anybody? <laughs> feel free, jump in. Your, the best conversation is your own personal experience and uh, because we can all relate, we've, we're in education, we're facing trauma ourselves as well, mm -hmm. as well as our students and our principals have trauma. We all have trauma in our lives, um, but how we handle it, I think is really important too. Anybody have any, um, any comment um, on that? In regards to what Nicole just said about some resistance to this, especially in the, well, this, this is the real world kind of resistance yeah. <laughs> um I, I i think we do need to be realistic about the fact that um especially for newcomers no canada is not the safe space that we want it to be mm -hmm. um that some of these that i think a lot of newcomers might actually come to canada expecting that this country as a whole is going to be a safe space but that's not the case mm -hmm. um and so in that sense, there I, I understand the concern about sort of coddling the student, but I think that trauma-informed might also include healthy coping strategies, the teaching of healthy coping strategies. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the coping mechanisms we're talking about are sort of maladaptive trauma responses. But if we could create that safe space in the classroom so that maybe some 
thing that we're doing can give the students the preparation they need to deal with the traumas of real life here in Canada, especially those related to things like um, sexism, racism, homophobia, you know, the cost of living, natural disasters, right, et cetera. Um, these are part of the reality that we're living with. And coming to Canada is no, no way, by no means, an escape from that. Um, so I think that part of being sort of part of trauma-informed education, I think that should entail maybe teach, guiding the students to have healthy ways of coping with trauma. Mm -hmm. hmm. I love that harmony. And I have a lot of international students at Sheridan um, and I'm even last semester, it was 90% were international students in our summer intake. Um, and literally people, I just arrived a week before they came into class and I could tell like they weren't saying anything they're just staring at me on the first day and I could tell like they were just full of so many emotions and nervousness and here's me walking in and who is this person um, but I think just acknowledging right that what people are dealing with and naming it like you did so well that goes a long way so I remember I did that that first week. I said, I imagine a lot of these things are coming up for you. And these are things I've heard from other international students who've come here. Um, and they all fall, started to nod. Like, yes, that's what I'm feeling. Yes, that's what I'm going through. Yes, that's an issue I'm facing. So not really normalizing that um, and giving people space where they can maybe kind of just acknowledge, right? That things are difficult and there's lots of barriers and things I'm facing. But in terms of the coping strategies, um, yeah, if there's space to do that, to talk about ways to cope and what supports, you know, we should all have like a list of resources for our students of where to get help, either within your school or in the community. Um, all of those things are very helpful. Um, and my last point around trauma-informed education is about social justice and change. So it's about naming these problems, naming the traumas that are happening and really working to 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 bring around change, right? In, in whatever way we can. So it starts with naming it, acknowledging it. And this is the right platform too. If we are educated, if you educate us, we can educate others and so on and so forth. It doesn't stop here, that's for sure. Yeah. Very good point, thank you. This, um, like I teach at Niagara College and every term I try to create a safe place as much as possible even mm -hmm. though I don't know or I don't have enough knowledge like Nicole said but I can empathize that especially mm -hmm. for either international students or the students are moving from different provinces to come to Niagara College and start the program everybody is anxious right they are nervous mm -hmm. first time at school first time at in that specific classroom given the resources that we offer at Niagara College because they don't know that's a huge help right there or making mm -hmm. it available on your platform like my case I posted on Blackboard I also yeah. put it on my PowerPoint I put it on you know quite a few places make it more accessible maybe they don't know how to click there but they know it it's on the PowerPoint so they can just mm -hmm. go there so show them all the little details on the blackboard so that they feel comfortable to move on or I also tell them like you feel free to come and approach me uh, if you would like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation please email me um, or if you like, for example, if somebody has letter of accommodation, I will ask them, please come and see me so we can sit down and have a working plan together so that everything right, you know, runs nothing nice and smooth. Please don't hesitate or worry that not to talk about it. That is totally fine. But other students, if you do not have LOA, right? This is still totally fine to come and talk to me. We are all human mm -hmm. beings. We are all going through some sort of difficulties, beginning of the term or middle of the term, whatever is the case. Just come and see me when you think that you're going towards that direction. You, mm -hmm. Your body will give you the signal. Situation will give you the signal. For example, you're not getting good grades, right? That's a good time to come and see me. Come and talk to me. How can mm -hmm. I help you, right? Or reaching out to them through email, 
I take my attendance. I'm very old school. Mm -hmm. I have lots of students in class, but I got a habit of taking attendance. They don't get any grade for it, but believe it or not, it's just most of my students are coming to class because I'm taking part, you know, mm -hmm. attendance, like my attendance sheet. I get to know them better. I learn their name better and they appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And I literally tell them there will be no grade. But for example, if you cannot submit your assignment on time, I check my attendance, then I can make a decision accordingly. So, and they, you know, they love that idea. So things like that is very helpful that what I do with my class. That I so Banal, you. those are all very trauma-informed practices that you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't call it that, but that's what they because are. Because of your right? webinar that I had. No, yeah, you were doing those before. <laughs> Yeah, but those are all, I don't think we realize like a lot of things we are doing already are trauma informed, right? And mm. those are great, great strategies. Thank you. Anybody what a great else? country this is. What a great, great country to to be in, truly. Yeah. Can I just raise another point, uh, Cornell? I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, you just opened a can of worms in terms of um, some of us teachers I'm a wonderful teacher, but I am such a dunce about technology. And I'm having a really, really hard time keeping up, especially since COVID, the explosion of stuff online that we are ha that we have to learn. And some of us are really, really, really struggling with it. And I feel like the students are coming to class much better informed in how to get things done than I am. And I'm feeling more and more I don't like to use the word stupid, but I'm way behind in terms of technology. And as a supply teacher, I'm not exposed to it as much as the, the full-time teachers might be. And I don't always get the chance to um, inform myself of what's going on out there. So when you were listing all the different ways that you make yourself available to your students, I'm like, what is that? I've never heard of any of that. So I'm kind of feeling a little bit behind. No, Did I think that too, stress you. Yeah, sorry to cut you off, Melissa. I think the um, it just helps a lot when you participate or um, get involved with other community members, like attend uh, webinars or going to the conferences, um, going in more technology related webinars. I mm -hmm. find that they are very helpful and very eye opening. I also do have mature students. They are not really good with computer skills and all that. And but everybody has their smartphone. I was like, you know what? Yes. This is an important mm -hmm. slide. Take your phone, take a photo. Maybe you cannot find it on Blackbird, but it is on your cell phone. So you mm -hmm. can flip it and look into it. And then you can still find a solution, something like that. But, you know, it's helpful, helpful for sure. And be, I'd say be compassionate to yourself because mm -hmm. the last three years have been very difficult, right? <clears throat> um, for lots of professionals, but as educators having to move to online and learn all oh. these things and then go back in person and Absolutely. back and forth, like it's been a lot, right? And so we're probably a little burnt out and tired. And so yeah, be, be compassionate to yourself. Yeah, for sure. Have Actually, we are usually, as instructor, we are really hard on ourselves most mm -hmm. of the time. We always think that we are lacking something. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, it's good, but in a way, it's not so good. Psychological-wise, it's not good. So therefore, Nancy, give yourself a credit. I think you're doing a great job. You mm -hmm. Probably you're supporting your students totally different way than many others don't, right? Everybody yeah. has some strengths and weaknesses. So well, let me just say that after one very just very stressful supply class, um, one of the students at Coffee Break, he approached me and said, teacher, how do you like your coffee? <laughs> like he was that mm -hmm. empathetic to my stress that he thought, I got to get this lady a coffee. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> uh, that's yeah, that's really it's nice. not easy. I, but I do make sure that my students are aware of the fact that I am not a tech whiz. Okay, I want them to understand that and, and be comfortable with that. I'd rather them understand that I'm not a tech whiz than expect me to keep up with them on all levels of technology. So I'm more comfortable your, with that. It shows you're a human, right? Like that exactly. we're all, we have our strengths and our areas to develop. So I think they, exactly. they like when we're, we yeah. humble and ourselves. Probably, yeah. 
you probably rock in other areas. So don't, I do. don't yeah. you do. So don't <laughs> give up. Don't give up. We've got a, a chat here. Jay Wallace. He says, this has been a great discussion, but especially in an ESL environment, it seems that a top-down approach to trauma-informed trauma -informed education is necessary. As a three-hour shift working with more than 20 learners, sometimes not even having the, yeah, the time to take a break is more than enough to handle. That in itself is a lot. It is, yes. And what's the reason for not taking a break? Yes, where where are I'm, you, Jane I'm gonna, Wallace? I'm going to challenge you on that. You need yeah, to take a break. A you need question. it. And they Jane need Wallace, it. where are you? Why aren't you breaking it? Mm -hmm. Maybe he's, uh, ty they're typing Maybe in. Typing, always typing. Um, um, I can share mine. <laughs> Sometimes I don't take a break. The reason is uh, some students not comfortable talking in class, opening up, and mm. after class they will like to talk to me or they have a question sometimes I do remember holding my bathroom break too because mm -hmm. I want to listen they have something to say I want to show them I care but at the same time I'm neglecting my own needs that's for sure mm -hmm. but sometimes you gotta balance it whenever you could but sometimes it's necessary sometimes you said oh quickly use the washer mouth right back. <laughs> and our RJ Wallace said the same thing basically he was he, they are helping those who did not understand yeah, yeah. And they important. Have so I get that I get that too I have my classes yeah. are three hours too and sometimes I have 45 students as well yeah. um and so and even it doesn't matter if you have 10 or 20 or 40 mm -hmm. like I think at the end of the day you they need a break you need a break and I think that would be a best practice because we have to slow down sometimes. <clears throat> we need to like leave the space, even if it's just to get a glass of water or walk outside or, or get some food or yeah. talk to our colleagues. Um, I would really encourage you to make the time for that. Um, it's so, so important. And you need it too. Like you yeah, need that break. Yeah. But even when we take a break, they all come to us. So you're not getting the break, but maybe you just say, <laughs> I need, I'm, I'm promoting self-care. I'm promoting wellness. So I'm going to let you all have a 15 minute break. I'm also going to leave the space and you can talk to me after class. Like you're yeah. modeling. So I think sometimes we have to model these important self-care wellness strategies um that's being trauma-informed too is recognizing wellness and self-care is important too uh just uh, to continue hl why didn't that name come up uh, also for some students short breaks 10 15 minutes between activities are important agreed mm -hmm. for them if they need to walk around eat something etc yeah i agree lower levels especially yeah, it can be I also like to, yeah, I also like to just say like whenever you need a break, like if you have to go to the washroom, like I remember even hearing my daughter like years ago when she was in younger school, like that the teacher would say washroom breaks are only at this time with the young children, like they can't mm -hmm. control their bladders like we do, <laughs> right? right. Um, like shouldn't we be able to leave when we need to leave a space, right? So kind of just giving permission to say if you need a break feel free to leave no questions asked just leave quietly enter re-enter quietly but we right. will take a break at the halfway point because we all need that wonderful we don't know exactly what's happening right sometime yeah. even meeting after class like last tuesday i i had a late class i finished around 6 30 and then she wanted to talk to me after class and i kindly sit down somewhere because um, she had disability issue and all that and she wanted to talk quite a bit and on conversation up another conversation i think we ended up talking half an hour i was like oh my goodness by the time i get home my brain was overloaded mm -hmm. <laughs> so tired sure. so much information <laughs> but i felt like um i did something good because she was very appreciative uh, that I did listen to her she later on she, the next day I received an email saying thank you for listening to me and thank you for understanding thank you for your accommodation so I felt good all the thing that I went through I was like it was worth it yeah <laughs> good I guess right. that's how the teachers come themselves I, I did good all right good for yeah. you wonderful you deserve it <laughs> that someone just put in there you deserve it um, oh, thank you. Okay, shall we move on? Any let's other do it. comment? Let's do it. Yes, okay. please. So, question number five. 
as educators, how can you take care of yourself, your well-being in doing this work? I think that's a very crucial so and important question. Mm -hmm. So let's start with Nicole. So number one, take your breaks. Yay! <laughs> very simple thing we could do. Um, yeah, I think this is the piece that we're, we're often so focused about our students and all that they're dealing with that we neglect ourselves. Um, but it starts with us. So we need to fill our cup to be able to help others. And so I would say it's so important to make sure you're engaging in self-care and wellness strategies in your own everyday life, that you're taking those breaks where you can um, debriefing the impact of the work. I hope all of you have a colleague or a someone or a good friend or someone in your family that you can talk to about the impact of the work that you're doing because we need spaces to debrief and talk about like that was a really hard class or I had this disclosure today and it was really hard or you watched this video today and the students were reacting um, it's so important to do that to practice that because sometimes it just takes just naming it and talking it through that we already start to feel the shifts in our own self um, and in creating a culture of that in our work environment, I think we're possible, informal or informally, that you can um, really practice that. And then I'd also say um, a lot of self-reflection, right? Really reflecting um, on how you're impacted, um, your own lived experiences, if they're coming up and getting that support that you very much deserve to. Thank you, Nicole. Very Nicole. good. Floor is open to everyone. Please feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Put things in the chat. I think everyone's just thinking, right? Mm -hmm. That's good. Thinking is good. We'll give them mm -hmm. time. Sure. Of course. And we can't say we don't have time. We have to make time. Even if it's five minutes, ten minutes a day. Like, we have to or we'll get burnt out. And then we're not going to bring our best selves to our yeah. classrooms. It's also easier said than done. It really, it's it's mm -hmm. a true process. Okay. Yeah. You get caught up with things and you realize you didn't take the break. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Especially when it's so busy, you don't even realize. Mm -hmm. Ah. Alia Khan, take myself break along with students. Seek professional help. Yes. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So have the break with the students. Why not? Right? Enjoy. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. Sometimes we do need that professional to speak to, right? Because Absolutely. Of the, impact, the impact of the work. We don't talk about this enough is the that's what we found in our research when we engaged employees and educators um, at the school a lot of them were saying that no one's thinking about us like as educators like the, the focus is a lot on students but what about us like mm -hmm. our well-being our needs how we're impacted we're experiencing vicarious trauma we're experiencing re-traumatization in our own classrooms but we're so busy taking care of our students um so again it starts with us we have to find those spaces to do that that is, that is very quite nice radical. it's sad but at the same time the you know many institutions just volume more of the students because they are bringing money in mm -hmm. financial wise we are taking money out so therefore even like when we have reading break or whatever is the case um some teachers are still go to the school and do mm -hmm. other things. And some of the things are closed because students are not there. But what about us? I'm still working. Mm -hmm. Even the coffee shops, most of the coffee shops are closed. Only one available for the entire school. I was like, hmm. So do we need to bring students all the time so we can also access the things that we need? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Very true. Reading week is not a break for educators. Yeah. Break yeah. from teaching. Break from teaching, but then we got to do all the other stuff. Teaching, but right? you still plan and meeting and mark markings, yeah. meetings, right? For sure. Any other comment? If not, I like to have you know good quality of time for the discussion. So oh, just one more thing, Ganol. I'm sorry for the interruption. It's it's a little bit of a, a cute one from Jay Wallace. My school is next to a cemetery. 
I usually go for a mental health walk immediately after my shift to refocus. Perfect place. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's good. Mm. Cemeteries yeah. are very restful. Yes. Quiet. Everyone's mm -hmm. resting there. That's for sure. Perfect. Yeah. That's why we say rest in peace. Right? You got it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Let's, let's do our breakouts. Perfect. So the breakout rooms for the people that are not really know or doing this for the first time. So Merita already included some breakout rooms according to our numbers we have. Can you receive an invitation, please accept. And also remember what group you are in, because when you come back, you'll about you'll have about eight minutes in the breakout room, Melita. We can give them a little bit more because they've been yeah, so vocal. Maybe Ten minutes in the breakout room. <laughs> so Don't you start can chatting. get to know each other a little bit and talk right. about the breakout question. And then make sure to have someone that will talk on behalf of your group. And remember, if you were in group one, two, three, or four, whatever the group uh, total of how many groups we have so far? We're going to have five groups of four okay, participants okay. or so. So you just need to remember which group you are in and make sure to make a decision. So this is the breakout room question. So I'm going to read out loud before you go to your breakout room. What situation have you faced that could benefit from a trauma-informed education approach? Okay, welcome back, everyone. I hope you truly enjoy your breakout room activity question. Mona, I love your background. <laughs> Way to oh, go, girl. Uh, oh, it's wonderful. Mona. That looks lovely. I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, because we have limited time left, so we don't want to keep anyone any longer than what it is. So we'll start with room one. Do you remember which room we were in? Any Brian, J. Wallace, and Shadi. Brian, would you like to unmute yourself? There we are. There we go. Hey, Brian. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Great. Perfect. So, um, yeah, yeah, we were talking about some of the, the traumas that uh, we, we some of the situations we experienced. And I was relating the story about how some of my students from, uh, from Africa, they were primarily um, Francophone Africans. And some of the experiences that they told me in the classroom were so shocking that it was hard for me to know how to continue. And I know some of my colleagues, some of the, the female teachers in my school were quite upset by what they heard. And uh, I would be teaching a lesson on something very, very ordinary, like, um, you know, hand tools or something. And my teacher would say, well, teacher, in my country, they use those tools to torture us or kill us. And so I, it was very difficult for me to, okay, uh, so I was on eggshells. I was afraid to mention other things that we take for granted that, but to them might be very uh, full of uh, memories that were very disturbing. And um, so, yeah, I felt like I was on eggshells at times. So sometimes it's uh, the teachers have to be trained a little bit on how to react to, to trauma situations. And one of my colleagues in the the breakout room was saying how um, in some countries uh, uh, a family would have uh, have to sell a daughter in order to buy food to support the rest of the family, mm -hmm. and the money that they get from selling the daughter would support the family for just a few months. And then what do they do? Do they sell another child? And what happens when they have no more children? So these are things which are so they seem to us so bizarre, so surreal. That sometimes we don't know how to react to it as teachers because we've never had to live with this and it and, and it's it seems like it's almost like it, it's, it's it's too unreal to be be normal but to other people to our students sometimes it is and so there's trauma where you least expect to find it mm -hmm. wow thank you so much that's that's heart-wrenching it, it, it's quite sad but we are truly appreciated you sharing that with us absolutely Brian, that's a real example of the vicarious trauma, right? That educator yes. space. When you're so moved by those stories, you don't forget. You'll never, you never forget those. I yeah. can tell even as you're sharing it. So the importance of you getting support and debriefing, and and then just being compassionate and empathetic to the student who shares with you, like you did. All right. Let's go to room two with uh, Alia, Hand, and Maisa, please. So okay, please, so. Thank you. 
last year I had uh, this lady who just came to class like with broken fingers, bruises on her face and arms and and she was like crying most of the class time, disturbing the, the students and I couldn't do anything because she doesn't want to talk about this issue. I tried to talk to her, but after some time she came to me like out of the blue, opened up to me. But the problem is that she didn't want to receive any help. She didn't even want me to refer her to a social worker or settlement worker. But luckily I found on Tutela, one of the websites you are using domestic violence, it's a H5P activity. Excellent. And it's an activity that has all the contact numbers and, web and websites that you can log in and ask them for help. And I think after two or three months, they responded to her and she moved to one of the shelters in London. Oh. Yeah, this situation, but you know, the trauma was obvious. I can see the bruises, but I was thinking, what about trauma that is hidden? That's right. Yeah, especially when the person or the students doesn't want or resist help. That's oh not it. Yeah. Yeah. Just not ready yet, right? So having those resources like you did is amazing. Yeah. Have, those, have those available for all your students because not all of them will come to you and tell you or you might not, might not see the signs like you did in this case, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to room four, Caroline, uh, Firuze, Giuseppe, Harmony, and Jane. Harmony? Um, basically, we're fairly new at this and none of us actually had anybody that um, had any trauma. Um, I think, I know in my class, um, I only teach on Tuesday nights. Most of most of my people, even though they've come from war and torn um, countries, we never discussed any of that because I actually teach online. I don't teach in a classroom. So yes, I, and that's what I got from my other two uh, classmates. Okay. okay, no problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Wonderful. Um, room five, uh, Jagdev, Mona, and Nancy. Last group. Um, Mona and I were in the group. We did not have Jagdev in with us. Yeah, I, I tried to shift him over. I guess he got lost in translation there. Okay. <laughs> um, Mona, did you want to say anything about our chat? Yeah, I think uh, uh, we talked about that, uh, although sometimes uh, if uh, people that they born in Canada, like they don't have direct uh, like uh, war, trauma or any like uh, more, uh, um, you know, difficult uh, uh, life, uh, then we can learn from other people like uh, from um, by listening or just train ourselves online by uh, like uh, attending workshops, YouTube, uh, watching YouTubes, uh, learning some strategies to help our students. Uh, and I, I, although I did not talk about the this part that sometimes uh, these kind of conversation, it's lengthy. And once you open, uh, it, this is gonna take it's, it, this is going to take time, and you should you should make sure you should make sure to have that time to listen yes. and to respond, right. uh, and to re refer them to to the, uh, some proper resources. If you don't have the time, so you don't open a big conversation, otherwise it's going to create mistrust, and they say that uh, I can get the I cannot get the help. Absolutely. Interesting point. Very interesting. Yeah. I always like to say just really quickly support with boundaries. Like be that if that's the if they're disclosing to you, maybe you're the first disclosure. Um, you know, you want to show belief and support and validation, but we want to make that referral to the, the supports at your school or in the community. Um, we don't have to do it all, right? Just remember that. Um, so support with with boundaries around what are knowing what our roles are too. Because I did work for one year with Canadian Mental Health Association, oh. and uh, so I have the experience and uh, as a case manager. So uh, you know, it is um, it's not just yes and no question, and it takes um, um, hours and hours uh, time. So uh, it's and it's a very sensitive topic. If somebody opens uh, to you, then you make sure 
to have that time and to have a proper place, not like in front of all students. And... Right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. We we've come to the uh, that time, haven't we, Ganal? Yes, we did. Thank you so much, Nicole, for sharing this wonderful, you know, topic with us. It's it's kind of sad, but we all need to be aware of it and we need to educate ourselves at least a little bit. As you said, we don't need to be expert in the field like Nicole, but if we know a little bit, we can help ourselves first and help others, right? Thank you so much. So if you have any other questions that you didn't get a chance to ask, please make sure to connect with Nicole. This is her contact info, or you can just, um, you know, um, she has her link in, or you can just email her, whatever you prefer. And again, thank you so much everybody for participating and for joining us this evening. We had a great discussion session. It was fun, wasn't it fun? Sure it was fun. Again, I right? know you guys rock. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Ooh, join us again next time. Stay tuned. Absolutely. <laughs> we do have the love session every month. Please feel free to join us. And thank you again, everybody. You have a, have wonderful a good night. Thank you. Take care, Blessings. Everybody. Thank you, Nicole. Thank, thank you, Ganal. Thank, thank you. Bye for now.